So although uh, injuries to the head and face are more prevalent in collision and contact sports, what we know is that the potential for, he for head a head injury to occur can happen in any sports, um, but particularly they're most common in our in our contact sports. Um, I save this segment for last because it's the head um, or the brain, right, um, that gets traumatized and could potentially lead to death in our patients. So wanted to kind of progress in terms of, of what we were talking about. So as we begin our talk on head injury assessment, and um, the discussion really needs to start with the anatomy first. So as we look at the anatomy, right, of, of the CNS or the central nervous system, what we know is that it, it houses number one, the brain, um, but then number two, the, the spinal cord, right? Um, we already talked about the spinal cord and spinal cord anatomy, but I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time diving deeper into the brain anatomy. We know about the brain is that it is housed within the cranium, right? And the cranium is that bony structure that if we were to tap on our foreheads, we would feel that, that bony anatomical structure. So that bony anatomical structure is responsible for protecting the brain from injury and, and, and from damage, right? So we're thankful that we have this hard external structure, which protects that very soft structure, which is known as the brain. The cranium itself is comprised of 22 bones, and those 22 bones work together um, in a concerted effort to protect our, our brain from injury, from damage, etc. The brain, as you know, and as I mentioned, is is a part of the central is a part of the central nervous system, um, and in essence, it serves several different uh, roles. Um, all of them, which are a voluntary muscle activities, um, it will interpret sensory impulses. Um, in addition to kind of controlling higher mental functions such as memory, reasoning, intelligence, learning, judgment, um, and and emotion, right? So those are just some of the basic things that the brain does. But on a more complex level, like if we look deeper within the brain, what we also know is that it regulates our heart rate. It's responsible for our breathing and our blood pressure, coughing, sneezing, etc. Everything that we do essentially somehow is cognitively, emotionally linked to the brain. So injury to the brain, right, can certainly have an array, can cause an array of signs and symptoms. So this is where it becomes important to be able to assess head injuries in patients who have suffered from some type of trauma to, to the cranium. So as we're thinking about uh, mechanisms of injury, which we talked about with every other joint, the brain is is no different. The mechanisms of injury um, are very descriptive and kind of describe the, the motion or the direction in which the brain is, is kind of moved to cause the injury. So the first mechanism of injuries is it can occur through translation, which means that brain slides maybe backwards and then forward, backwards again and then forward. So there's this movement that's occurring um, with the brain in, in the cranium, right? And we can imagine that if the cranium were covering that brain, when it translates backwards, you're going to have an injury. When it translates forward, you're going to have an injury, right? So that's one type of mechanism of injury. The other type of mechanism of injury is a compression injury, right? Uh, and so we can see the arrows pointing inwardly uh, with the idea that there is this, um, this pressure or compressional force that occurs that causes maybe an injury within the central focus or force point. So that's a compression injury. And then last but not least is a rotation injury. Rotation injuries typically happen from um, kind of turning your head too quickly, right? Um, or an example from boxing might be if you get punched in the cheek and then you rotate your head and so there's a rotational injury that can also happen. Most common mechanism of injury most likely is going to be uh, translational in, in nature. So as we continue to progress, um, we have to kind of differentiate between the terms traumatic brain injury and mild traumatic brain injury. Um, when we use the term mild traumatic brain injury or MTBI, what we're referring to is a concussion. When we use the term traumatic brain injury, what we are referring to is something that is that causes lifelong consequences and um, and can lead to death in our patients if we don't recognize the that the injury has occurred. So there are differences between the terms. Again, mild traumatic brain injury is a concussion and traumatic brain injury is something that happens as a result of, of a trauma, a fall, a blow to the head, like let's say a baseball bat to the skull. Um, so there are differences and distinctions between the two different terms. And so we should not use them interchangeably.
terms of head injury mechanisms, um, there are two different kind of traumas that can happen, right? We've talked about translational, we've talked about rotational, we've talked about compression. Uh, and now what we're really doing is kind of putting a definition, a definition on how these things can actually occur. So you can have a coop injury. So as it says here, coop injury and coop injuries most often happen when a stationary skull is hit by a moving object, right? Uh, and so trauma uh, to the brain is most often on the side that was was struck. So an example um, of this would be uh, I'm standing still and someone takes a baseball bat and hits my skull, right? My skull was stationary and I got hit by a moving object. The injury to my skull is going to be on the side that was hit by the object. You can also have what's called a contra coup injury. Uh, and so what we're saying there is the moving head strikes a stationary object. So an example would be, I take my head and I ram it into a wall, right? If it's a contra coup injury, most often that trauma is going to occur to the opposite side as the brain either rebounds or what we call translates off of the skull. So I hit the wall, right? My brain translates forward but then as I come back, it translates or rebounds posteriorly and I have an injury to the posterior aspect of, of my brain. Uh, the other type of injury that we can see most often in our um, boxing sports is going to be that repeated concussive forces, right? We see that in boxing, we see that in soccer. And if we were to up, update this slide, we would say MMMA uh, is where we also see those repeated subconcussive forces, right? So we can have a translational injury, which most often is going to be contra coup. You can have um, a compressional injury, which most often is going to be a coup. Doesn't always have to be. Um, or you could have that repeated subconcussive forces, which could be any of the two, but certainly um, rotation is going to be a part of that as well. So let's talk about mild traumatic brain injury, um, or as I've put in parentheses here, a concussion. I think if you look at the two different terms, mild traumatic brain injury and concussion, I think most of us um, in the United States would say, oh, concussion, no big deal, shake it off, let's go back. But if we use the term mild traumatic brain injury, then there's this hesitation, right? This hesitation to return an athlete to sport. So we've since, in the last 10 years, we've shifted our terminology of concussion to the use of mild traumatic brain injury or, or MTBI. When we're talking about what an MTBI is, we're defining that as a clinical syndrome characterized by immediate and transient impairment of neural function. So what's that mean? It happens immediately, but it, it doesn't, stay and it isn't prolonged. So these are temporary uh, lack in, in neural functions, right? And this temporary cessation in neural function could certainly mean a few things. It could be that the patient has an alteration in consciousness. Other word, in other words, they lose consciousness for an extended period of time. That could be five seconds. That could be 10 seconds. That could be 30 seconds. They could not wake up. That could be a coma. They might have disturbance in their visual um, and equilibrium, uh, which is caused by mechanical forces. So in terms of disturbances of vision, uh, most often patients will uh, distrib exhibit sorry, uh, tunnel vision and won't be able to see um, out past that, that tunnel. And then they lose the ability to really balance on, on one of their limbs or both of their limbs in, in essence. So... Mild traumatic brain injury just sounds so much better than, than concussion because of the things that are associated with this pathology. So let's talk about epidemiology. What we know um, about MTBIs is it's estimated that 300,000 sport-related TBIs most often happen. Those are mostly mild traumatic brain injuries um, or MTBIs or concussions um, in the United States annually. Just think about that. So in our contact sports, most often MTBIs are going to be reported um, as the means for, for head injury. What we also know is that the recovery time um, is longer in, in high school student athletes than it is for your adult counterparts. And that, that really truly just has to do with e, the um, makeup of, of the brain um, and the amount of sodium and potassium that exists in a high school younger athlete uh, that doesn't exist in an adult. So it takes longer for 
a high school student athlete to recover. And this is important for those of you that want to work with the adolescent population to keep in mind that while their signs and symptoms may have recovered, they certainly still take an extended longer period of time to recover from, from a head injury. And then we have to talk about this right here. The risk of secondary impact syndrome is huge in, in younger athletes. So what is second impact syndrome? If we're defining what this is, what it means is that the patient has a head injury and then they return to play too soon and they take another hit and then instantaneously they literally drop dead on the field. And that is because the brain did not have time to recover. So with that being said, um, the risk of secondary impact syndrome is a lot higher in younger athletes because younger athletes are willing to take more risk, right? Which is why it's important to have competent healthcare practitioners at the high school level to ensure that they are the ones who are um, protecting the athletes since the athletes just don't make great decisions um, all of the time. So in terms of mild traumatic brain injury, there, I mean, obviously there's a wide array of, of uh, symptoms, right? Because the brain controls so many factors. So what I want to kind of caution you here with is there's a list, certainly there is, but ultimately every patient may present differently depending on the area of the brain that is compromised um, in the injury itself. So we have to be careful to make sure that we're not treating all of the mild traumatic brain injuries the same. We treat them based on their, their signs and their symptoms. So in terms of the signs and symptoms, there's a, uh, there will be an array of neurocognitive psychomotor symptoms. And again, that's dependent on the, the area of the brain that's going to be compromised. But what we know about head injuries is that patients might present with a headache, could complain of dizziness, lack of ability to coordinate, and loss of balance. Some of them, not all of them, vomit um, or experience nausea, particularly if that vagus nerve is impacted. Some report blurred vision and double vision uh, or, or probably most commonly sensitivity to, to light. Um, and then with some uh, head injuries or mild traumatic brain injuries, confusion, disorientation, and difficulty concentrating or sleeping. Uh, and, and this is a big deal. Um, I think this is the hardest one for us as clinicians to sell is this part right here to teachers, right? Just think this student can't come to your class for two weeks because they have a head injury, right? But the reality is we want to allow the brain to heal. If we place a student in a situation where they're having to learn material, take exams, and the brain's working, it's processing, and so it doesn't heal um, as fast as we want it to. So in fact, a lot of times what we'll do is remove students from academics to allow the brain time to rest and, and to heal. Some patients might report that they can't remember the events that happened just before the head injury, which is called retro grade amnesia. And so the way I think of that is retro is throwback. So um, information before or they can't remember things after the injury, which is anti-grade, after anti-grade um, amnesia. So we can either not remember things before, which is retro, or some of them can't remember things after, which is which is anti-grade. Uh, retrograde amnesia typically is a sign and symptom that the mild traumatic brain injury is more significant because they've lost memory of things previously, right? You would expect that a patient might not remember things that happened after the injury. That would make the most sense. So this sometimes is a sign and symptom of the severity of the head injury. A lot of times with, with uh, mild traumatic brain injury patients, what they also exhibit is irritability uh, and behavioral changes. And, and part of this is linked to um, the uh, the sodium potassium channels changing most certainly. But then it also is just the reality that they might get frustrated that they can't remember things or that they don't perform as well as they used to. Right. Uh, and then they might have or suffer from like transient uh, changes in consciousness and unconsciousness. Again, probably a concern prior, probably um, more likely not as mild of a traumatic brain injury as one would expect if this sign and symptom is, is present. So again, this is a generalized list, right? You don't have to check all of the boxes to assess a patient as having a mild traumatic brain injury. And so we're going to talk about kind of a customized approach to assessing mild traumatic brain injuries. Okay, so I kind of wanted to talk about um, the different ways in which we assess a, a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury. And in, in, you'll see on the slide, it says outdated criteria. And that's because it truly is. Uh, what we typically used to do is, is grade or give the, the patient a degree of injury. Uh, and that, that 
that scale was kind of based on neurological signs and symptoms and when they returned and then um, any loss of consciousness that consciousness that happened. So with the first degree, what we would say the differential is they're, they return to normal in terms of neurological signs and symptoms. So what does that mean? Their balance re restores quickly, their memory, their, I don't know, I'm just thinking, their attitude, right? All of those things kind of return to normal within 15 minutes. In a second degree, um, there's typically antegrade amnesia, so they can't remember what happened after the injury. They'll typically have balance disturbances and tinnitus, and, and those will last longer than 15 minutes. And then with a third degree, the big differential is going to be, um, would have been the retrograde amnesia, right? The, the ability to recall things before the injury actually happened, and then any loss of consciousness. So a third degree would be any loss of consciousness. So does that make sense? If they lost consciousness for five seconds, that's a third degree. If they lost, lost, if they lost consciousness uh, for two minutes, that's still a third degree. So there are, this is an old outdated criteria. What we want to do is kind of look at the, the newer criteria um, and, and also look at things that uh, are equated in, in this particular grading scale. So a grade one is no loss of consciousness, post-traumatic amnesia, um, about 30 minutes. So they, they might not be able to recall things um, for at least 30 minutes post-injury. And then this PCSS is post-concussive signs and symptoms that um, last for about 24 hours. And so post-concussive signs and symptoms could be things like headache, could be things like vomiting, um, but those things all kind of resolve within 24 hours, right? Okay, as we move into grade two, you'll see one difference, right? That in fact, we are accounting for a level loss of consciousness. In the older scale, there was no loss of consciousness in the grade two criteria, right? So what we're saying here is the patient does lose loss, of, does lose consciousness, but that typically they wake up within a minute. They have post-traumatic amnesia and that post-traumatic amnesia lasts at least 30 minutes or more. Um, and then last but not least, they, they might have post-concussive symptoms that last longer than, than the 24 hours, which was established in the grade one um, MTBI. For grade three, we can see that we still have loss of consciousness there, but that loss of consciousness must have been for at least, at least a minute, right? In addition to that, they could also have post-traumatic amnesia that's greater than 24 hours and then post-concussive symptoms that are that last longer than a week, right? So if our patient's still coming into the clinic and stating they have a headache, they have nauseousness, irritability, et cetera, after seven days, then now we're grouping them into a grade three criteria. And this is a lot more specific and takes into account multiple variables um, that really come together to truly determine what grade of injury does does the patient have, right? Okay, so in terms of how do we manage concussions in sports and what what should you know about mild traumatic brain injury? Some of you are going into physician's assistant school. Some of you are going to be medical doctors. And there are a small percent of you who are going to do athletic training. All of you, though, will at some point in time be managing a, a post-concussive patient, right? Our physical therapists are going to be the one rehabbing them. So it's a still, when you look at it, a, a entire healthcare problem. So let's go ahead and talk about best current management. Um, is the patient symptomatic at rest with physical exertion, with mental exertion, right? So that's really the questions that we kind of have to ask ourselves. Number one, is the patient symptomatic at rest? Then are they, symptom are they symptomatic when we have physical exertion? And then when we add them back into the classroom, do they still um, have symptoms, right? So there's like a three kind of level approach at rest, physical exertion, mental exertion. What do those three things do to our patient in terms of their, their, sign, their signs and symptoms? The hard part is with concussions is that there's no rating system that has been widespread accepted across the country, right? Different states, different countries have different ways of assessing and managing concussions. So all I can do is kind of give you what the gold standards are, um, and then you can live by what your governing body would decide or determine for you as a healthcare practitioner. What we do know and what's consistent across the board is reevaluation of the patient on a daily basis, basis is essential. What we know about the signs and symptoms is that they change. One day, they might be feeling completely fine. The next day, they could have headache, vomiting, and irritability. So what we want to do is 
treat this patient like we're going to assess them do a full-on assessment of them every single day that they come into our clinic. We are not going to build off of our assessment from the previous day. We're going to start a new baseline assessment for our concussed patients, right? And this is different. This is so different than any other pathology that we've talked about, right? With an ankle sprain, we do the initial assessment, we treat, and then we kind of add to that assessment based on how they're doing the next day. With a mild traumatic brain injured patient, we kind of want to start that assessment from baseline every day because the signs and symptoms may change. They may progress and then, or they might get better. We know about concussed patients is that they're, they're more prone to recurrent concussions. Um, and, and if they are, what that means is they'll suffer from multiple concussions. And so there's this cumulative effect that may happen over, over time. We now know that level of consciousness isn't the only predictor of recovery after a brain injury. There are other um, signs and symptoms that we should consider in the return to play of, of a patient or an athlete. Um, and then what we know about neuroimaging studies, um, they're typically unremarkable, right? And so it's hard to use an MRI or a CT scan to help determine return to play. Um, so what we really have to do is kind of have our own return to play guidelines and that's most often determined by your team physician or the physician who oversees the practitioner who's making those return to play decisions all that to say is imaging is important and we're going to talk about a different type of head injury but it's most important in a true traumatic brain injury where we can see bleeds in the brain that might lead to death in our in our patient so in terms of current management we want to look at all of the signs and symptoms, right? We wanna look at behavior, we wanna look at patient history, we wanna look at comorbidities. And while yes, we hopefully don't have athletes or patients here at Point Loma that use substances that they're not supposed to, but if we, as we leave Point Loma and progress into the community, we wanna look at history of substance abuse, depression, uh, and migraines, right? Because a patient who walks into us with a headache is it because of the head injury or is it because they suffer from migraine? So these are all historical questions that we're going to have to ask our patients uh, as they walk into our clinic to make sure that we truly have a mild traumatic brain injury um, on, on our hands. I've already mentioned this once in the PowerPoint, but younger athletes are at greater risk. Remember that the brain takes a lot longer to heal in a young athlete than it does uh, for an older adult athletes, right? Um, and so we have to be careful and probably more conservative with how we treat our younger athletes than than our adult our adult patients. Uh, this second bullet point: uh, almost all hemorrhage second impact impact issues occur in young patients. So what I'm saying to you is, be conservative with these patients. Right? It's not the adult that we really have to worry about in terms of whether or not they're going to get secondary impact syndrome, it's most often going to be those overzealous high school athletes who have a point to prove, right? Uh, and so then last but not least, what I would say is um, you athletic training people in the room, you um, athletic directors in the room, you are the ones that are going to have to make the call to remove that athlete from competition, right? And in particular, with any loss of consciousness, right? And mo try, try convincing a coach that, you can you want to remove an athlete from participation because they lost consciousness for five seconds they'd be like he just needs to suck it up he got his bell rung right so we have to be careful uh with this you know you obviously you guys obviously know that i'm not the most conservative clinician in the world but when it comes to brain injuries i am absolutely ultra conservative because it's the difference between life and death in some of our patients in particular our high our, our high school patients so Things that you could read to be up to date um, are these two things here. It's the NATA position statement on mild traumatic brain injuries and the Zurich uh, position. Okay, in terms of return to play, this is probably the hardest component of mild traumatic brain injuries is trying to determine a patient's readiness to return to play, right? But what we know is that when you are assessing return to play, your uh, criteria for return to play should include cognitive balance, functional test, provocative test, right? So cognitive, what brain wise, how are we going to stimulate that mental wise, reading wise, how are we going to stimulate the brain? You're going to assess a balance, which we'll look at on a different slide. And then we're going to do functional tests, sports specific stuff to see if it's going to exacerbate the signs and symptoms. And then we're going to try to do any test that we think would truly irritate the brain, right? So stop and go, 
rotations, things that we think would cause um, an increase in their neurological signs and symptoms. All post-concussive symptoms should be resolved prior to returning to play. So what we know um, about mild traumatic brain injuries and the gold standard right now for return to play is that typically we will return an athlete to play when they've been um, when they've had a resolution of signs and symptoms and have been symptomless for a week post resolution. So let's do it this way. Day one, patient comes in and says they have zero symptoms. So, okay, we let them practice. They come in day two and they have symptoms, right? So sign symptoms back. Then that seven day period starts all the way over until they're symptomless again, right? So then let's say they come in day three and they're symptomless. So we let them run around, um, right? And then day four comes around and they're symptomless again. So then that would be day 10, right? Day 10 that they could return to play because that would be three plus seven more days. So you guys can see like when we're returning a patient to play, it isn't okay. They were symptomless this day. They came in and then they were, they had symptoms. So our seven day period doesn't start over. No, it does. And that's the frustrating part about um, concussions is that that period, that clock, that, that clock starts over anytime they come into the clinic and they report symptoms. Here's the thing. You do not want to tell your patients about this clock because then guess what they do? They come in for seven days in a row and they fake it. So you, that's an internal clock for you to use as, as a clinician. The unfortunate thing um, that we know about patients is that patient symptoms are unreliable, right? They may not know how to describe them. They may fake it, right? And so sometimes we have to use patient reported symptoms along with objective tests to help us determine patient. Okay, guys, so here is the big deal with repetitive head injuries, right? I said previously that a patient who suffers from one concussion is most likely to suffer from another, right? And it's because of the risk of the sport or the uh, career that they, they're in. But what we can't see and why I call uh, mild traumatic brain injuries a silent killer sometimes is because... We can't see the long-term consequences of the disease, right? Ultimately, we can be quick to return them to play, but as healthcare practitioners, if we're educated, then what we'll be thinking about is CTE, or the development of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which essentially is like this progressive degenerative disease of the brain, right? So they can't see this degeneration happening over time, uh, but it's most often found in patients with repetitive brain trauma, most often athletes, right? And essentially what happens is they take these repetitive blows to, to, the, to, the, to the skull um, and the brain becomes injured in that process, right? Uh, it's these repeated brain traumas that kind of trigger the progression of the degeneration of the brain tissue. Um, and then what happens is ultimately we have this buildup of an abnormal protein called, called tau or the tau protein. Um, and these changes in the brain can begin months after the head injury or it could take decades to kind of kind of develop over time. The scary part about this disease is that it presents very, very similarly, right, to post-concussive uh, signs and symptoms. And so those the signs and symptoms of the development of CTE, memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, right? impulse control problems, aggression, depression, suicidality, um, the list could go on. So it, as, as the patient gets older, these things become very hard to kind of deal with. And essentially what we've seen over time is some athletes have actually taken their lives. In particular, uh, I think since we live in San Diego, we could think about Junior, junior Seau. Um, and so the hard part about the diagnosis of diagnosis of CTE is that it can't be diagnosed currently until post-mortem. And so what we see here in the image is a normal brain. Uh, what we see here is a CTE brain. And then um, what we kind of see here is a brain with, with Alzheimer's. And so what you'll see, um, I don't know if you guys can see them very well, but um, I'll use my pointer. You can kind of see these little red uh, increases, right, um, in vasculature and the laying down of the of the tau protein, right? Uh, and so essentially what happens is we uh, assess the brain postmortem and determine um, that they've had CTE, but it's not diagnosed while they're living, right? We can only kind of diagnose it based on the signs and symptoms that they're exhibiting. So we want to be careful 
um, to not return our patients to play too soon because of the development of, of CTE. There's this thing called post-concussive syndrome. Um, so the signs and symptoms of post-concussive syndrome um, are decreased attention span, trouble concentrating, impaired memory, irritability, right? Uh, so these, these are the signs and symptoms after the concussion has happened, right? What we know about post-concussive syndrome is that it certainly um, is exacerbated by exercise. So one of the things that we do, remember I said that progression, physical exertion, mental exertion, right? Um, we're going to essentially at some point in time, once the patient is symptomless, have them do some sort of low level exercise to see if in fact the signs and symptoms are exacerbated. And if they are, then we're worried about post-concussive uh, syndrome. And again, we don't return them to play until they're seven days symptom free. In terms of long-term consequences, we, we know that there are balance disruptions, which we've talked about already, and diminished cognitive performance. So inability to recall things, uh, inability to function on exams or sit in class for an extended period of time with focused attention, ring a bell. And so when these symptoms are exhibited, I am going to laser this away. The athlete should not return to play until those symptoms are resolved. And I would even add until those symptoms are resolved and have been resolved for at least seven days. If they return to play while they are um, while they have symptoms, then we know that we're increasing the risk of secondary impact syndrome, which is literally leads to instantaneous death on the field. And neither of us want that on our hands. Okay. So in terms of special tests, like how do we rule in a head injury? We, we can't rely just on patient signs and symptoms. So there's several different ways to kind of do that. The first one is through a neurological exam. And so how do we do that kind of in the clinical setting? So we can test, test the cranial nerves. Um, so testing of the cranial nerves um, would be something like having them smell coffee beans, having them um, balance, right? So we're going to have them balance. We're going to test their, their reflexes, kind of like you do when you go to a doctor's office and they tap on your patellar tendon. Uh, we're going to ask them questions, right? Uh, so we can test antegrade and retrograde. So antegrade um, stuff might might be things that kind of happen after the injury, but it's retrograde stuff that we want to test, right? So do they know their birth date? Do they know where they live? Do they know their address? Do they know who dropped them off at school? Antigrade will give them like a list of three things to remember and ask them to repeat it a minute later. So it could be something like apple, pencil, eraser. And we're gonna have them repeat that, right? So different ways to test both antigrade and retrograde amnesia. We're going to assess eye function because remember, we've already talked about pearl, but we want to make sure those pupils are equal and reactive to light, right? And if they're fully, if they're fully blown, then the concern is there's a head injury and we're refer referring out right away. In terms of balance tests, we're going to do the Romberg test and the balance erring, error scoring system test, which I believe is on the next slide. So we'll talk about that then. And then we're going to do the finger to nose test. Most people know that as the sobriety field test, but it is also the equivalent for the head injury as well. So we want to make sure that they have court head hand eye coordination. As I mentioned, the balance error scoring system is here. Um, it's a progressive series of tests. So what the clinician is going to do is start here first, right? Patient stands on two, two feet and closes their eyes. And what we're looking for are several different errors. Hands lift off of the iliac crest. So do they come off to catch balance? Do they open their eyes during the test? Do they step, stumble, or fall? Does the, the hip move into 30 degrees of flexion or abduction to kind of catch them? Uh, or do they remain out of the testing position for more than five for more than five seconds, right? These are all points that you're going to add. If that makes sense. Then if they do this well, then we want to progress them to single limb with their eyes closed and use the same assessment tool there. And then last but not least, you may think that this position is actually easier than this one, but it's not. So essentially what they're going to do is stand with one foot um, in front of the other. As they progress and they get better, then this would be the challenging component to this step this would be the challenging component to this step and then vice versa right what we're looking for is the number of errors in a minute time frame and you'll know they're getting better because 
every day that you test it, the number of errors should decrease over time. So it's a really good tool to assess patient's balance ability. Okay, so we've talked about mild traumatic brain injuries. And so now what we're getting ready to segue into our traumatic brain injuries. These are focal uh, injuries that happen to the brain and can lead to death if we do not recognize them. Okay. So we're talking about secondary impact syndrome, which I've already talked about several times in mild traumatic brain injury, but it's it if a mild traumatic brain injury progresses, it can become traumatic and it can lead to secondary impact syndrome. So what is secondary impact syndrome? It is a disruption of, of normal auto-regulatory brain function, most often as a result of ischemia, which means lack of blood flow uh, and necrosis, so type, some type of cell death within the brain. This is always associated with a second trauma. So in the patient has post-concussive symptoms and you return that patient to play, they take a blow to the head and uh, as a result they literally become unconscious on the field. So essentially that blow doesn't have to be hard, doesn't have to be fast, doesn't have to be at a high velocity. It was often associated with a contra coup injury. So the brain is moving and hits a stationary object. So the hard part about this is what we know is physiologically speaking, uh, there's increased cerebrovascular congestion, uh, brain edema, so swelling, uh, and then there's an intracranial hemorrhage that we cannot see. Um, and, and so what happens is um, they have signs and symptoms of a grade one concussion initially, but then they rapidly de decline. So what we can see in terms of statistics is, is a 50% survival rate. So 50-50% chance that if a patient has post-concussive sy symptoms, they take a blow, become unconscious. We have a 50% chance that likelihood that they will survive after that, that second or third blow has occurred. So what am I saying, guys? Be ultra conservative with a patient who has had a mild traumatic brain injury, in particular with a patient who's a high school student who's had a brain injury. All right. So intracranial hemorrhaging, as the name implies, bleeding within the actual brain itself. If we suspect that a patient has an intracranial hemorrhage, their signs and symptoms will be headache, vomiting, uh, disorientation, altered levels of consciousness, increased blood pressure, decreased pulse, and unequal pupils. If I underline something, these are the differentials, right? If I check something, then what that means is those signs and symptoms are relatively the same as a mild traumatic brain injury. But the differentials are that unequal pupil in your pearl assessment, yeah? It is that, all, that, that increased blood pressure and the decreased pulse. So if a patient presents to you with all of these symptoms, but in particular these three following a blow, then that's a medical emergency because more than likely they have an intracranial bleed. Okay, guys, so we're talking about an epidural hematoma, which is an intracranial hem hematoma. Most often this is as a result, so we're talking etiology here, most often it's as a result of some type of massive blow to the skull, um, so like a blunt trauma to the skull, which causes a, a laceration of the arterial vessels. So just keep in mind, the arteries are under the pressure of the heart, right? Just as kind of a lens into the uh, catastrophic nature of this particular injury. So we have rupture of blood vessels. Those blood vessels are artery or arterial in nature. Um, this most commonly happens um, between the skull and the dura mater, right? Hence the reason it's called an epi, right? So it's not necessarily right. Um, it's not in the brain itself. It's just on top of it. Um, in terms of why this is such a concern, um, what we know is typically a tremendous amount of force is usually required to cause an epidural hematoma. But with that said, it is the most um, catastrophic and concerning of traumatic brain injuries. So what we know about uh, an epidural hematoma is most often there is a rapid onset of signs and symptoms, like immediately following the, the blow. They'll be symptomatic within 48 hours, if not immediately. Uh, and then the concern is the signs and symptoms are the same as, as a concussion, right? They're going to have the same signs and symptoms. The differential is, number one, their, their headache, it will increase. It will spike. Uh, it will be almost debilitating in nature. 
most often they're going to go into a coma and then they'll they'll die eventually. So this is an injury, right, that we have to treat as a medical emergency. Since bleeding is under arterial pressure, does that make sense? That hematoma may expand rapidly, right, and compress and cause death in our patient. So most often what happens is that patient is rushed into uh, surgery with a neurosurgeon and then um, that that bleed is is drained. In terms of like prognosis, 5 to 10% mortality rate if it's treated within the first few hours. So anytime a patient has a head injury, regardless of if it's an MTBI or a TBI, what we always do for the for that day or that night, depending on when that injury happens, is we have someone wake that patient up every hour. And the reason we do that is to make sure we are not missing an epidural hematoma. Does that make sense, guys? Because it may not present with symptoms in the first few minutes after after the injury. It may take 24 hours to build up, but in that 24 hours, it may be too late. So if you have a patient who has a head injury, one of the things you want to do is if you send them home with a parent, with a spouse, with a significant other, family member, whatever, you want to make sure that that family member wakes them up every hour um, for the first day or the first night's sleep just to make sure their signs and symptoms haven't progressed because they can die in their sleep. The next type of pathology that we're going to talk about is a subdural hematoma. Uh, what we know about a subdural hematoma is a hematoma formation is going to occur between the brain uh, and the dural mater. Um, but the awesome thing is that it occurs to the venous structure, right? So in other words, that head trauma is going to cause a rupturing of the veins uh, with, within, within the skull. And, and the great thing I think about the subdural hematoma um, is that it's, it takes a slower time to progress, right? But then the the concern is, man, takes so long to progress that we forget that it could actually be a potential. So in terms of, of its signs and symptoms, they're very slow to develop. Sometimes they take hours, days, even weeks after the injury. This is why I say, you guys, with head injuries in general, you really aren't clear uh, until that patient probably doesn't have signs and symptoms for at least a few weeks, right? Look at that, for at least a few weeks. So in terms of home home instruction, so that patient is symptom, they took a blow, but they're symptomless. It's similar to that with an epidural hematoma in that we still want to wake them up every hour just to make sure the signs and symptoms, right, haven't progressed. So what are the signs and symptoms? Same, similar, headache, uh, but you, you see that there's no increase in the headache, a rapid increase in the headache like it was with the epidural hematoma. They'll have altered levels of consciousness as the bleed progresses, impairment of cognitive function, motor function, and cranial nerve dysfunction. So ultimately, we just have to watch the patient over time. We know about a mild traumatic brain injury is that those symptoms should be getting better over time. With a subdural hematoma, those symptoms will progressively get wor worse over time, right? With an epidural hematoma, there's a fast progression uh, in the onset of the signs and symptoms. So if you had to differentiate if this were on a test, epidural hematoma, arterial bleed, which means the signs and symptoms progress a lot sooner, a lot rapidly um, with a subdural hematoma because the venous system is involved. Those signs and symptoms have a slower onset and probably this is the more scary of the two because it takes a longer period of time to develop. And by then we're, we're probably like, okay, we're out of the, we're out of the blue. Um, so now this patient's probably fine. Just be careful guys. If I haven't scared you yet, I'm hoping I scared you now. Okay, so if we're looking at the, the subdural hematoma, you can kind of see where that bleed is actually happening, right? So you can see how that bleed is really applying a lot of pressure to, to the brain itself. So again, while it's a slow, slow progression, essentially, it certainly can lead to death in, in our patients. So again, you want to check on your patients daily, right? Until all of their signs and symptoms have resolved. Again, signs and symptoms should start resolving themselves in a in a patient who has a mild traumatic brain injury, whereas in patients with either subdural hematoma, epidural hematoma, those signs and symptoms continue to increase or do not resolve themselves. So those that's, to me, one of the biggest differentials over time. Okay, so when we're looking at uh, subdural um, hematomas and epidural hematomas, kind of here's what they're going to look like 
um, on on an MRI, so you can kind of see some of the some of the bleeding um, here in in this image. Last but not least, we have a skull fracture, which could certainly lead to a subdural and epidural hematoma because the amount of force that's required to fracture the skull is probably the same amount of force that is required to uh, cause an epidural um, or a subdural hematoma. But the etiology is a blunt force trauma to the skull, uh, which could lead to a fracturing um, of the bones of the skull. Um, and then more importantly, may lead to cerebral spinal fluid leaking from the ears or the nose. So let me say that again, cerebral spinal fluid, uh, which is think about that spinal fluid coming through the nose and, and the ears. If that is the case, if this clear fluid is coming through the nose and the ears, that is a sign that the spinal cord is compromised and that is a medical emergency. In terms of what battle sign is, so battle sign is when we look on the back of the patient's ear, uh, there's a bony prominence there. If there is bruising behind the ear, then that you're concerned. That is battle sign. 911 or drive that patient to the emergency right away because more than likely they have a skull fracture which compromised the brain and potentially has compromised the spinal cord um, as well. I hope this has been informational. I hope you've learned a lot about the different types of head injury and why it's so important that when we have a patient with a head injury that we don't just shake it off and say, oh, it's, it's no big deal. Head injuries, regardless of if they're mild or traumatic, uh, they have the potential to cause long-term issues and deficits within our patients. So we should treat them as conservatively as is possible.